Good afternoon, my name is Graham Darby and I'm the UK Country Manager for Pyramid Computers. And I just want to give you a bit of a personal view, I suppose, as to what I see are some guidelines, rules, if you want to call them that, for how you handle um, kiosk deployment. So what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of context about Pyramid and why I think uh, we know a little bit about how to ma manage kiosk deployment. Um, a little bit about how we see the role of kiosks and what they're, they're good for. Um, two or three rules as I see them and then perhaps give an example of what I regard as a bad kiosk deployment and why I think it's a bad kiosk deployment um, of which we can probably talk for hours but nevertheless I'll try and keep that relatively short and then perhaps an example of a good one and then if there's time for questions at the end then obviously quite happy to take questions as they come through. So Pyramid Computers is a, is a German company uh, we've been selling kiosks for over 10 years and what I've put up here on the slide is the range of kiosks that we actually currently provide. Um, we're probably best known in the UK for providing the kiosk for Marks and Spencer, and that we, we did seven years ago. Uh, and that has been a, an endless aisle application where people can actually go to the kiosk if they can't find the goods on the shelf, and they can actually buy the goods from the kiosk, typically their website, and pay for them there and then, have them delivered to home, or have them delivered back to the store within uh, 24 hours. As it shows on the slide, we do a variety of different kiosks. Uh, we do predominantly indoors and predominantly for the retail and hospitality sectors. Um, we also do outdoor kiosks for uh, ski passes, car parks in Austria, Aust Austria Germany, etc. Uh, and then we do things like retail magic mirrors, um, self-folding kiosks for restaurants, etc., etc. So I would argue that we've got a pretty good span of uh, products in terms of providing kiosks for people. Uh, we've certainly got an international span because we, we cover most of Europe um, into the Nordic Territories, the UK, over across into the United States and Canada. And I would view that as being a, a good representation of the things that we have tried and seen and sometimes failed, but sometimes succeeded as well. So hopefully you'll find that useful from that perspective. Uh, just to give you a flavour, this is one of our most recent ones. This is um, in Etika in Switzerland and Germany and this is a kiosk which is currently on display on the Epsom stand. Um, this is a kiosk which they use to showcase the products that they have available in the store and also because they try and encourage the people who shop within Etika to use their recipes, their menus, they can follow etc etc mm -hmm. and in this instance they're providing uh, menu information which can be printed from the, the receipt printer below or can be scanned uh, from the uh, adverts that they produce in newspapers and they put this throughout the store as an as a added extra for the customer so one of the benefits of shopping in Etika supermarkets <coughs> not just the quality of the merchandise but the fact that they can give more value by offering uh, recipes and menus etc. So in that in, with that in mind um, without being too grand about this and sort of trying to come up with an overarching vision what, what I try to do is sort of put down what we see as being uh, the role of kiosks and why they should be useful for people. So, in my terms, it's about an intuitive, consistent, constant service which puts the user in control and gives an economic benefit to the service provider. And uh, the point about this is I think there's two distinct elements to why kiosks are provided. One is for the benefit of the end user, the person who's actually going to stand in front of the kiosk and press the touch screen. And the second is, of course, the company, the retailer, the hospitality unit is actually is providing the kiosk in the first place. In my experience, if you are not considering both elements of that, then your kiosk deployment is going to fail. And more importantly, if you're not considering the end user as the priority, then often it will fail as well. And I have seen many, many kiosk deployments which have been driven by simple cost analysis of taking people out and providing a touch screen. Um, and that's, uh, that as a, a, an objective is fine without really appreciating how the kiosk is going to be used by the end user and what's going to happen. Best example I can give you of that is doing retail deployments with a retailer who should be nameless um, and going to deploy a kiosk which was there for people to order their goods for home delivery um, and being told that the kiosk had to go in the corner when the traffic flow was over on the other side of the, of, of the shop and when I ask why are we putting it over in the corner is well that's where the plug is the complete lack of understanding that the customer is not going to go over into the corner just because you have a, a plug in the corner. 
they will only use the kiosk if it's convenient for them to use. And the point about putting this message up here is about, ultimately this is about giving the end user, the shopper, or the person using the restaurant control. They want to get as much control as they possibly can, and if you provide them with a mechanism for control, they will use the technology you put in front of them. And I think that applies whether it's a kiosk, whether it's any other type of technology, whether it's scan and go, whether it's self-checkout, or whatever the case may be. This is about putting the customer back in control, and if you can do that properly, you stand a fair chance of seeing success. So my starting point would be this. This is a slide from Steve Jobs, obviously. This is something he said quite a few years ago. Um, and in many ways, this underpinned the whole of the essence of why Apple, I think, was successful. Because in his terms, he was about putting the customer, the end, the customer experience first, and working back to the technology. And to do that, you've got to effectively reshape the way you think, and not get steeped in what the technology can do, but get steeped in what the technology benefit has for the customer. And whether you applied this 100%, I'm not sure, but as a starting point, I think this was a good way of thinking about how you should go about looking at your kiosk. So if you think about it in terms of the end user and the provider, the retailer or the hospitality outlet, you think about it as an overarching, what's in it for me? What's in it for the end user? What's in it for the person who's actually going to press the screen? Because if the end user can't see the immediate benefit, then frankly, they're not going to use it. And what I've discovered with dealing with retailers such as Tesco and Sainsbury is when they were looking about introducing um, self-service checkouts or self-checkout, a lot of the time you could argue it was actually put together for uh, cost benefits because one operator could look after half a dozen tills. But actually, what they also found, of course, was the customer quite liked self-checkout because they were in charge of the process and they weren't feeling as though they were waiting. They were feeling as though they had completed the process and getting out more quickly. And so if they could see that immediate benefit, then they would encourage people to use it. So if you're looking at a kiosk for doing things like queue reduction, check-in at an airport or check-in at a hotel, or providing better advice than standing in a queue at a customer service, and it's clear that the customer is going to use that for those particular purposes, then that's what the immediate benefit is, and that stands a good chance of actually seeing a de good deployment. The other element, of course, about this is like all kiosks, if they're working co correctly, they should be providing you with a very consistent and good service. The beauty about kiosks is they don't forget to turn in in the morning. They haven't gone to bed late the night before. They haven't forgotten what the promotion is. They haven't had a bad day. And they quite happily will provide the same message every time. That's very important for most retailers or hospitality units because getting that consistent service is something they aspire to uh, on a regular basis. And my, my final point, I mean, it, it's a bit trite in terms of saying, is it easy to use and is it friendly? But actually, this is about um, providing a service to people in a way that they're going to want to come back and use again. If you provide a service through a ticket machine or a kiosk or a car park machine and you stand there and look at it and you're thinking, I have no idea where this ticket goes or what I'm supposed to do next, it doesn't exactly encourage you to come back and use it again. You may have to because that's the only way of making payments. But what you want in most environments is that loyalty to the service, excuse me, is that loyalty to the service and you want the kiosk to actually reflect that loyalty. So that's in it for the user, for the end user. What about the retail, the hospitality units? What's in it for them? Well, in my experience, it's one of three things. You're either going to make more money, or you're going to reduce your costs and improve your efficiency, or it's going to encourage people to come back. Let's be frank, if you can get cost improvement, most retailers will listen to you. You might say to them, but I'll improve your revenue, but that's not necessarily a given. And so therefore, that's a harder argument to actually fulfill. The cost benefit of actually putting in some kind of technology which takes out labor costs will always take precedent. I'm not saying that's right, but in my experience, that's what happens. If you can get all three of those, of course, happy days. That should at least give you a very good chance of getting further redeployments from just simple trials. Again, in my experience, you're not likely to see that for, whole, for reasons which I'll come into a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So if your starting point is just revenue and enhancement, you have to have another message as well. Otherwise, you're going to struggle to get through and see where it goes. I want to put this in here because 
I want to talk about some rules about, or some guidelines that I see that actually help you with any kiosk deployment. And I put this in for two reasons. One, I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in a few minutes, but I put it in for two reasons. One, because we manufacture a lot of McDonald's kiosks. So that's always nice to have that pat on the back. Secondly, I think the McDonald's kiosk has become a catalyst for change in terms of people's attitude to self-service technology. And I, wouldn't, I would never underestimate how much impact that's actually had for all of us in terms of the business we have at the moment, or retailers in terms of the way they operate, and of course, <clears throat> hospitality outlets as well. Because all of a sudden, they, they've tapped into that benefit of the customer wants to take control of the process, and if you give them a mechanism for taking control of the process, they will do it, and they'll remain loyal to it as well. I'll come back to the impact that's had in a few minutes. So in terms of specifics, um, I would argue there are three things that you should start looking at. And the first one is, you know, why are you doing this? What is it? What's the problem you're trying to solve with your kiosk? It's no good just turning around and saying, well, other people are doing kiosks, so why shouldn't we do it? Because I don't think that's a good reason. If you can't define what the overall objective is going to be, then frankly, uh, you stand a very good chance of failing in the first place. I always tell the story about sitting next to um, the operations director of Homebase. Well, I can tell you who it is now because they no longer exist at a dinner about four or five years ago. And he said, I'm glad I've sat next to you. I said, oh, why is that? He said, I need to have a conversation with you. I said, why? He said, I've bought 300 iPads. Oh, yeah? He said, I don't know what to do with them. And that sounds a stupid conversation. But actually, it, it was very symptomatic of somebody being seduced by the technology and having seen iPads in other retail environments and thinking that would be a good thing, <coughs> but I don't know how that's going to work. And my argument to this is, if you can't put down what your overall objective is to determine what you're trying to achieve, what's the point? You're just going to end up wasting your money. The second point about this is you've got to decide what the return on investment will be. Because sure as eggs are eggs, the, the CFO is going to want to know why am I spending all this money on this kit and what am I going to get back out of it? And it's not just as simple as saying, that's what I spent, that's what I'm getting. You've got to look at it in more holistic benefits. So you've got to look at it in the round, such as what impact does it have upon the staff who are using it? What feedback are we getting from our customers in terms of the technology? How are we actually going to use this, these kits at our best advantage? And the third point is, this cannot just be a one department innovation. You can't just give it to the IT people and say, can you implement this for me, please? Because by definition, it must have an impact across the whole business. And you need to think about the impact it has on processes. So, for example, uh, we used to manage um, a screen network in Sainsbury's across 350 Sainsbury stores where we would provide content, uh, mostly advertising content. And we would change that content once a week. And I would say to them, I can change this content within 25 minutes. And I could change it daily. I could change it hourly. Why am I only doing this once a week? That sort of negates the benefit of any kind of digital technology. And the answer, answer was very simple. We get a delivery to store once a day. So if you inflate the demand for particular items, let's say you're advertising breakfast goods in the morning, I can't cope with that. And all that's going to happen then is I'm end up with empty shelves and then a whole series of customers will be very unhappy. So there are existing processes and your technology has got to tap into that existing process, or you've got to have a very good understanding about how that process is going to change and what you're going to do about it. So, defining why you're doing it and the impact it's going to have is hugely important. Secondly, you've got to create your own solution. I can't tell you the number of times I've spoken to potential customers who said, I've seen that McDonald's kiosk, can I have one of those please? To which the answer is, no, you can't, because it's a McDonald's kiosk and it's their design, so you can't have that. But secondly, just because it's a McDonald's and it's clearly being successful, why do you assume it's automatically going to work in the same way in your environment? So that doesn't make sense to me, but believe me, it happens all the time. Secondly, there's a whole variety of options, a whole variety of technology, a whole variety of kits that you can have. And if you are being hidebound by one particular type, such as the McDonald's kiosk, you are disregarding how your customers are going to behave. So in many instances, frankly, the best solution is to have a, is to have a tablet. I hate that. I don't sell tablets. It's a waste of time for me. 
But actually, that may be the best solution. In many cases, a tab is entirely the wrong answer to that, and it should be a kiosk. But you've got to think about it in terms of the customers who are going to come through the door, what are they going to expect, and how are they going to use the technology you'll provide. And if you can't provide that adequately, then you're going to be wasting your time. <laughs> Thirdly, your customers are a diverse crowd. They're not all the same. And they will react to technology in different ways. And you've got to be prepared to accept that. And I remember one retailer telling me that when it came to technology, they had to address the issue that if sometimes there were students coming through looking for a few beers for the night. Sometimes it was mums and dads with kids coming in to buy food for the evening meal. Sometimes it was the little old lady with a shopping trolley. And if their technology couldn't address each of those groups, then what were they going to do? Turn those people away at the door? Tell them they weren't allowed in? <coughs> they couldn't address the technology? Of course the answer is no. So you've got to think of it in the round in terms of what uh, your technology will do for you and create your own individual solution. Thirdly, learn as you go. I think too often we either assume that technology is a bit of a magic bullet and it will solve all the problems, or we assume that it will address everything in one go and it's going to be perfect. And frankly, it's not. Um, I was at a presentation given by the customer director of uh, Argos, and he said they are obviously well known for introducing technology, whether it's um, click and save or click and collect or whatever, whatever the terminology is. And he said, we've moved from being an organization that spends probably six months getting all our technology innovation 100% right before we launch it, to uh, an organization that will launch it when it's 80% correct. And we know it's wrong in some places, but we also know it's 80% correct. And so what we will do is we will recognize we've got problems, and we'll make sure that the organization recognizes we've got problems, and we'll seek to change those problems and improve them as we go along. Because if we get it 80% correct, we know that the customers will accept that. And I thought that was quite a refreshing way of approaching the implementation of technology as such. So assume your customers will surprise you. Assume they will behave in a way that you haven't imagined, because they will. And accept that you haven't got it right first time, but develop it over a period of time. And watch out for the unexpected ancillary benefits. So again, a good example was a kiosk that you provided for Tesco, uh, the FNF, the clothing area. Um, and on that kiosk, there was an extended aisle application, so if people couldn't find the right size or colour, you could go to the kiosk, you could buy it, pay it on the device, have it delivered to home, delivered to the store. There was a scanner on the kiosk, which we just frankly put in as a bit of an afterthought because it, it, it was relatively straightforward to do. What we found was the benefit of the, of the scanner was for the staff, not for the customer. Because what the staff had to do was, if somebody said, came along to them and said, have you got this in green, or have you got this in a small or a large, they would have to go to the stock room at the back to find the goods if they had it, and then come back and tell the customer yes or no. Well, <coughs> most Tesco stores that have an F and F area in are huge. So that, that walk there and back could take over five minutes, by which time, of course, the customers got fed up, disappeared. By having the scanner and tagging, just putting the tag under the scanner, you could immediately see whether it was stock in the warehouse, and whether it was worth making the walk. Or at least you could then tell the customer, we haven't got it, but we can go on the kiosk and see if we can find it. And there'll be a whole series of these ancillary benefits which you won't even thought about. But that doesn't matter, as long as you find a way of logging them and understanding how you're going to do something about it. So, sort of three particular ideas. I want to show you a couple of examples of where I think, firstly, things have gone wrong and secondly, where I think that things have gone right. So this is the first example. You apologize, I apologize for the first example. It was taken by me on my iPhone. This is my local railway station out in Essex. It's Manning Tree Railway Station. Relatively small station. To your left, you can see the, uh, the, the entrance to the ticket office. And obviously in the middle there, you can see two ticket machines. The two guys in the vest were actually installing this on, on the day I was there. Both these kiosks were previously in the ticket office, just around the corner. So both of them were set up as internal kiosks, or either were set up as internal kiosks or bought as external kiosks and installed. So now they've moved them. Now they've moved them out to the front here. So obviously the cost of moving them must be relatively high, and as you can see they provided a canopy for the customer to actually um, use. 
So the first principle, the first problem is that the kiosks are set forward in the canopy. So if the canopy was there to stop you from getting wet, it fails miserably because you're standing out in the open. The more important problem is that these kiosks are facing the prevailing sun in the morning. So the sun is shining on the screen. Now I don't care how good your screen is. I, we do screens and our screens are bloody good. They ain't, they ain't that good. So at a time when you've got peak usage of customers searching for tickets, you've put your kiosks in an environment where the sun is going to shine on the screen and they will spend probably twice or three, three times the available time to buy a ticket. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is what gives kiosk deployment a bad name. Because all that happens now is people say, I'm, getting, I'm not going to use this. And you don't know whether this is a precursor to them closing the ticket office and making the poor guy behind it redundant. Or whether they just want you to buy online. But it negates what we said before about you've got to look at the whole customer base that you have. Oops. The whole customer base you have. And decide what it is that they want and how they want to interact with technology. Or not as the case may be. And your deployment has, got, has not got to try and shoehorn them into an environment where they're not happy and they won't be operating the tickets in the right way. Hands up, this is one of our deployments, so it's bound to be good, isn't it? This is something we do for banking sector in Germany. And they have the same issues in the banking sector in Germany as we do in the UK, whereas they're trying to close branches because it's uneconomic to do so, particularly in small towns, villages. So this is Spark Asset Bank, and what they've done is they have a virtual branch. So they still have the branch where it is, there's no people inside. You go in and you pick up the phone, the phone handset, uh, and there's a video screen and you talk to somebody at the other end of the video screen, so a virtual assistant in some respects. There's a scanner, A4 scanner underneath, so if you want to insert documents you can do, and the person on the other end can see the document and can see it working. And by doing this, what it's done is it's provided a service for the local customer so they don't feel as though they've totally lost their branch. But equally, it's making use of technology to provide a service to the customer that wouldn't be there otherwise. So they're trying to balance between the two things. I talked about McDonald's before, and I showed the McDonald's kiosk. And I talked about that being the catalyst for the way people look at self-service, which I think it is. So... The McDonald's argument when they put the kiosk in is to address a particular problem. So they identified the original problem they had, which was about queue management. Because what they found was when people turned up at McDonald's, opened the door, looked inside, even there were loads of people and they were all queuing for the food, they walked away. They were getting too many walkaways. So by having the kiosk in there, they can have much better control over queue management. People will go and use the kiosk to order their food. The time taken to get the food is probably not a lot different. But once you've ordered your food, you feel more in control of the process and you're prepared to wait. Particularly if someone's preparing your food, you want to wait to make sure it's done properly, etc., etc. So they recognise what the problem was and they've used the technology to actually deliver the service to help the customer. The ancillary benefit they got from it is the average basket size for McDonald's customers using kiosks is between 15 and 20% greater than when they're standing in front of a human being placing an order. Why is that? Because it's a consistent service, it's a constant service, you're getting the same level of service every time. The kiosk does not have a bad day, it has not got a hangover, it does not forget the latest promotion. And there's a psychology which they've tapped into as well, which they probably didn't appreciate at the time, which is when the human being stands in front of you and says, do you want large fries because you look a bit overweight to me, you're immediately going, oh, I'm not the large ones, I'll have the small ones, thank you very much. When the kiosk says, do you want large fries? Yeah, I'll have that. that's fine. And all of that has contributed to an average basket size, which is far in excess of what they anticipated. So the reason they are, they are rolling out kiosks right across the world, queue management, but also increasing basket size of that scale is out of all recognition to what they originally anticipated. So when you're looking at your return investment, that's a good starting point for that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, we've done a buyer's guide, if you want to have a, have a look at that, which is available on, on our website, which covers off most of the points I've talked to before. Alternatively, if you want to have a chat to me, that's my contact details. We've still have, uh, got the pyramid stand up for a few, a couple of hours since. Give me a ring or drop me a line. And if anybody's got any questions,